Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life and so what we're going to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life give them information and places to reach out to. So, stay tuned. Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you know, the mission for the Beacon Fight for Life is to reconnect the Australian and multicultural community. So today I have the pleasure of being in the company of Tandy Kawana, um, who's an advocate for the African community when it comes to mental health. Tandy was born in Zimbabwe and uh, she's won a, a few awards, which we'll get into a little bit later. Tandy's passionate for um, raising awareness for mental health. She's also a graduate of the African Leadership Initiative and presented a paper in 2017 to the panel for the African Studies Association of Australia and, and of the Pacific. The paper was on mental illness in people of, the Afri of African descent. Tandy also has been a speaker at Dubai for the G200 2017 Youth Summit and uh, Tandy is a registered, a trained registered mental health practitioner. Welcome Tandy. Thank you for having me Derek. No, it's my pleasure, thank you very much. Um, with the Beacon Fight for Life, what we want to do is reconnect the Australian and multicultural communities. So yeah. today what I'd really like to unlock is what the African community has available in Australia. And um, reading, a, a lot, there's a ton of information about you on the on the website. So congratulations on all the things that you've achieved and do, done and are doing. Thank you. Um, you were born in Zimbabwe. How long have you been in Australia? I've been in Australia for 12 years. Okay. Yeah. You enjoy it? Yeah. Call it home now. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. C A L D background. Cald. Yeah. What does that mean? Okay, so that's a term that means it's an acronym for culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Mm -hmm. I, I work closely with the Office of Multicultural Interest and from my understanding this term was for policy documents as they do statistics and policies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But all it is is to say people from um, nationalities who have a second language okay. who are now living in, in Australia. So people who come from other parts of the world. Um, and I think it's inclusive of everyone, if you think about it, except for the, um, the Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we're all culturally diverse in one way or another. How different is the culture in Australia compared to Africa? Um, I come from... Um, a collect, collective community and I think the Western world, some of the Western world is individualistic. So we, I, I personally grew up in, in a big family with extended um, family members. Yes. Um, so everything is done as part of a community. Decisions are made by elders. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's what's different um, between between our cultures, we consult um, the people who are closest to us on on decisions about uh, our lives, and mm. sometimes we get wisdom from from the elders, and it's all through some of the storytelling that we we grew up around. Yeah, so that would be completely different here. Oh yeah, very different. So that would play a big part in mental health in your community. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. When you when you think that for. For, for myself, I only have my brother and um, his family. Mm. Though he's the closest member, uh, family member I have in Australia. Mm. The rest of my relatives are back home. Yes. And, and that, that impacts heavily on who I am as a person, um, especially being female, mm -hmm. um, where growing up, 
decisions about my life were made by elders and the people around me and the males in my life. Mm. And then you come here, you live in Australia, and somehow you have to figure things out. Yes. So there's isolation that comes with living away from home. Mm -hmm. And there's the lack of support, um, your close networks, people who are familiar with your way of living, um, your culture and your religion and mm. your your beliefs so that make that impacts heavily on how i guess we try and assimilate we encourage to assimilate but it's not as easy as just saying yeah come to australia and assimilate it, yeah. it's very hard yeah i can imagine it would be <laughs> mental you're a mental health nurse yeah what got you into mental health so this is a <laughs> I, again, coming from, from Africa and my background, my mom decided when, from when I was young that I was going to be a nurse. So there was no escaping it. <laughs> so decisions about your life are made by somebody else. And her, her rationale was, you'll never be out of a job and you can travel the world. And, and now I get it. Um, but that's not who, who I wanted to become. But mm. anyway, I did end up... Um, in England and I was working as a nursing assistant okay. and I remember going into a mental health ward and they were talking about schizophrenia and I'd never heard that yeah. that term before so it made me more interested I, I was more curious to to know about this terminology and also there was a discussion about a patient who had bipolar and I remember then trying to figure out where this fits where I came from Mm. And I know that we didn't have terms like that. They can't be translated into my own language. Mm. So, and I remember having family members who had experienced a psychotic episode mm -hmm. and not understanding what was going on with them. And I was afraid for them and also wanted to find out exactly what had happened to, to my loved ones who had experienced a mental illness mm. because again back home we do not have that many established mental health services mm. so which means that he didn't get the support that now i think um he should have got mm. so that made me want to then study mental health nursing instead of general nursing that my mom wanted me to study so i've got here in the notes that tandy's passionate about changing help changing help-seeking behaviours of migrants who've come from countries without well-established mainstream mental health services. Yes. That's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Um, I personally was diagnosed with depression in, in 2016. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was a very challenging and difficult time for me because we're raised to be resilient. Mm. So then to be diagnosed with depression is almost against what I was told I am, which is you're resilient and you're strong. So I had to come to terms with the fact that if I'm not strong, am I weak? I didn't think I was weak. Mm. And also I didn't have the vocabulary to ask for the specific help that I needed. So it made it so difficult and fortunately for me my psychologist was really good and um, I was able to to describe how I was feeling and what was going through my head and it was so confusing because again I come from a culture where mental illness is is not acknowledged mm. and if you do have a mental illness people sort of like mourn you before you die like you cancelled you're yeah. a nobody you yeah. bring shame upon your family so all of those things were playing on my mind and then i've got the religious aspect where mental illness is believed to be caused by demons and then i'm a professional and i've got the theory behind mental illness and mm. how how you range from mental health to being um, unwell. Mm. So all of that was confusing for me. So internal conflict. Yeah, there was a lot of internal conflict. And the shame, I think, the shame that came with me just admitting to myself that I now have a mental 
mental illness mm -hmm. and being being a, a working in the in the field you, it's it's harder mm -hmm. it's hard for us to to ask for help so it doesn't discriminate it does not discriminate and that's what i learned so when i got better I remember thinking to myself that my story needed to be heard by a lot of people mm. because if I can experience what I've experienced and be confused, what about the people who do not have the knowledge and the theory of mm. mental illness? What, what do they go through if they do not have the vocabulary to talk about what they're experiencing? Mm. Because in their language, it doesn't exist. Mm. So. It's, it, and, and I then look back to when I was growing up and now I know that when my mothers and, and, and my aunts especially were under a lot of stress, they would voice it in physical health term. Mm -hmm. So you're raising my BP. That's what they would say. That's to say that I'm under a lot of stress. Yeah. So it made me understand that even though we didn't have the language, we experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I had, grown to be, I had grown up believing that, no, we don't experience it. It's not something that happens to, to an everyday person. Mm -hmm. So it, it just made me realize that there are a lot of people in the Western world and even here in, in Australia where I live who've experienced what I've experienced and don't know how to go and seek for that help. If, if the people that I was talking to at the time don't even know that if they can't sleep, they need to go and speak to someone. Mm -hmm. How about the eternal conflict and the pain? How would they vocalize that to mm -hmm. a GP? Yeah. So the language barrier. Yeah. The language barrier. Yeah. yeah. So, and the, it didn't exist in that language, those terminologies. Yeah. So, so we, and, and the terminology from where I come from and, and most of the African countries for mental illness is you're mad mm -hmm. and it ends there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And society kind of writes you off. You're yeah. mad. Yeah. And then picturing what mad looks like for me um, when I was growing up, it's people who live on the streets because people with a mental illness would then be left... Um, to live on the streets, families would not know how to manage their behaviors when they were unwell. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they were kept out of everyone's way mm -hmm. um, or they're just on the streets. Yeah. So that's, that's the picture that people have when they hear mental illness. Yep. And then it confuses people that, are you saying that's where I'm gonna end up? Because we only know the worst. And the worst is once you go there, you don't come back. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So how relevant is suicide in the African community? It's a taboo subject. Um, and we are only starting to acknowledge that it's, it's a problem now. Because I think it was in 2017 or 2018, within my own Zimbabwean community, we lost about six um, young men and women. Mm -hmm. And then um, in other communities, in the Ethiopian communities, there had been um, some number of people who, who had completed suicide as well. And it being a topic that we don't fully understand and we don't get to talk about, yeah. um, I think it just it makes it hard for those who need help to, to seek for help. Mm -hmm. Because once again, it's... It's stigmatized. Mm. So mental illness is stigmatized. Suicide is up there. Yes. That's and problem, yeah. every time when, when, when it's happened, when someone has committed suicide, the talk within the community is what got over them mm. when they possessed by something. So it goes to religious. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Something must have come over them. So mm. we're not yet fully understanding of how how prevalent it is mm. um, and that it can happen to to anyone and that sometimes even those without a mental illness can end up um, committing suicide. How much support is available for the African community in Australia? This is a tricky question because when I got diagnosed with with a mental illness my psychologist is is Caucasian he's white Australian mm. and I he did wonders for me. Here I am. I, I can share my story with no mm. shame. 
but the one thing I'll applaud him for is he recognized earlier on how religion was an important part of my life. Mm. And he kind of used that in our sessions. And I remember this one session, I was feeling so hopeless. And he said, did you go to church? I said, yes, I went to church. And he said, what were they talking about? And they were talking about hope. And <laughs> so then he used that in his sessions to help me to get better. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, um, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll get there eventually. The problem is the Australian mental health system is not fully appreciative, if that's a term that I can use, of the cultural barriers and, and the, the, the language barriers uh, that exist within the communities that make it hard for people to seek help. So if you can imagine someone who grew up in Africa or any third world country, they'd never spoken to someone about their mental health, about what's going on in their mind. Mm. They don't know that they have to. So the services are there. Mm. They're still, we're still working towards making them culturally safe and inclusive. But also there's a gap in knowledge within the communities of what mental health is and what mental illness is. Mm -hmm. And when you're mentally healthy, what do you do? And when you start getting unwell, where do you go to? Yep. So I, I often say, us in the community, we need to be speaking to services a lot more about what makes it comfortable for us to then engage with those services. Yep. And part of my work also is educating the mental health services on how to be culturally safe. How can they make people come to them? So the services are there, but there's just a gap between the community and the service providers. And, and I would encourage that service providers go into the community and create relationships with community members. Is that why you found mental health keys? Yes. Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> so when I decided to share my story on This Is My Brave, I, I, I was approached by one of the service providers and she said to me, can you come and run um, mental health literacy programs for the women that I work with? Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I'd never done, I'd never written a business proposal in my life. I had come up with one. I had to work out the risk and everything. But it's something that I was passionate about. And I had um, spoken to her about the work that I wanted to do with, with community. And from there, it grew. So I then started working with service providers like Isha, Palmerston, providing mental health literacy for the community members that they work with. Yep. So I was doing that for a long time and I couldn't, it was, hard, it was hard for me to see the social impact of the work that I was doing because of funding and funding comes and it goes. And at some point it felt like it was tokenistic diversity, the people have, organizations have ticked the diversity box to say they're working with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. But the work needed to carry on. So I then thought, how do I make a bigger impact? And I decided to then sit on boards because I thought if I am not sitting on the table where decisions about my health care are made, mm. Um, it's going to impact on my children. So then I started sitting on boards, um, trying to bring the voice of um, multicultural communities to the table because most of the health policies that we have to date um, are policies that were made a long time ago and they're being improved on and they do not reflect how diverse the Australian community is. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how I started. And by doing more work sitting on boards, um, I now feel comfortable that we're heading in the, in the right direction because there's now more people um, like me who are also passionate from different countries um, speaking into the policies of the health, mm -hmm. Australian Mental Health Services. So if someone that was out there was watching this was from African descent, yeah. and they 
thought they or they think they know someone that might be struggling or they might be struggling yeah how would they get hold of you um so they can go on my website www.mentalhealthkeys.com.au mm -hmm. um and on there will be my my details and i will try and link them with several services who are striving to work with people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and is it true you were inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame in 2020? <laughs> yes. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. What does Thank that mean? You. Wow. Um, I still can't believe that it's happened up yeah. to this day. Because most of the women who are inducted into the Hall of Fame, they've accomplished a lot of things in their mm -hmm. in their careers mm -hmm. and some of them are towards the end of their careers and mine is just mine is just starting yeah. and it was mostly because of the work that i do sitting on boards trying to influence policy and also working with community and being a voice and an advocate for services to change okay well i think you're being too humble <laughs> and you it sounds like you well deserved the award so thank you oh thank you um so, uh, did, would you like to add anything before we finish? Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for having me on your program. And um, I am a great believer in, in storytelling. And I think mm. I have healed from sharing my story. And, and, and I thank you for being a part of um, sharing of my story to reach a wider, a wider audience. Mm. And... I hope you can continue to work with more people from culturally linguistic diverse backgrounds so we have a greater understanding of the experiences people are going through and how they've conquered. The reason that I shared my story was because at the time I did not have anyone to look up to who had had a mental illness mm. who could still go back to work and look after her kids. Mm. So it was a really scary time for me. But after sharing my story, I know people can point at me and go on my Facebook and look at the things that I've done and think, if she managed to seek help, let me just try it. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, so that's a, a wrap for us. Thank you for, for listening. It's Derek Best here from Beacon Fight for Life. And make sure you take the time to smile today. Thank you.